Good morning. Good evening. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Episode three of our wonderful Tipsy Casting podcast. I almost always forget the casting part of it. Um, <laughs> you just want tipsy. <laughs> tipsy. I just want the tipsy part. <laughs> Um, we have an awesome uh, week this uh, this time. We have Chris Chung joining us from the wonderful Slow Horses on Apple TV Plus, um, welcome, welcome. who has been so grateful to be our very first guest. Thanks. So Yay, welcome. Good evening. Good morning. <laughs> Hello. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good night. There we go. <laughs> you hit them all. <laughs> yes. Hit them all. Thanks for yeah. coming on. <laughs> All right, Chris, what are you drinking? I see you take a sip. I just like any excuse to drink, to be honest. I am yes. drinking Hibiki whiskey. It's Japanese whiskey Ooh. that I got gifted. It's a lovely bottle. It's like, was the first thing that I could find. And nice. uh, I mean, one of the main reasons why I wanted to do this podcast was I love an excuse to have a drink. So here you are. <laughs> that was our goal in doing this is that we just want to get drunk every day. Well, <laughs> We're going to have a lot of episodes, 350. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I am doing, it's funny. I have a G&T, gin and tonic. Oh, However, I have no ice so in my house. Fish. So it looks like water. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not. Oh, that's funny. Jess, what do you got for us today? Um, I'm cheating today. I am, it's, it's for those who aren't aware from our intro, uh, we're in different time zones. So I am <laughs> in Los Angeles. It is 10 a.m. and it's a weekday. So I am drinking coffee. Um, but on our next episode, when we switch time zones, I will be having an alcoholic beverage. <laughs> good, good, good. good. Love to hear it. It's very good. <laughs> I've already done that on this. So. <laughs> One step at a time. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I was telling Jen, like, this is going to be the reason that I, you know, I turn into a lush, basically, is this will be the, the trigger. <laughs> but we'll all, we'll all be alcoholics and we'll be like, what what triggered you? And I was like, mm, tipsy casting podcast. That's what triggered yeah. me. <laughs> oh, oh, man. man. Okay. Yeah. So let's dive in. Let's talk all things casting, fun stuff, because you've been around. For those who don't know, you're, you are Australian, correct? Yeah, I grew up in Australia. Um, I I probably left Australia about 12, 12 or so years ago, maybe even longer, maybe 15 years ago. Um, I went to the States. I studied acting in New York in a Meisner uh, studio. And then I did a performance internship in Philadelphia. I kind of bounced around for a bit and then I landed in the UK. Um, I tried, I tried my hand in Australia as an actor and I think like maybe 10 or so years ago, I mean, the diversity in the projects that uh, were coming out of Australia was not really there. I think it's changing a lot now, which is great. Um, but I just knew that there was a better market uh, over here for me. So this is where I decided to uh, in London to, to set my career up. Did you have any connection out there already or was it, it you just like started anew? Yeah, I had a a really close friend of mine um, from Australia. Her sister worked at a talent agency here in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, it was a very low tier talent agency and I think they've since like uh, closed down, but they really did help me kind of get my first foothold in the industry. And I booked uh, a couple of, formative jobs with them i did a musical at the national theater called here lies love which is uh where i met my wife um and i also did a tv show for the bbc called waterloo road which was a um kind of recurring drama soap kind of thing um and i was on that for about six months so they did like give me the first credits that i needed to kind of establish myself as an actor in the uk um so I really don't think it's, I have a lot of friends that are so concerned about getting the biggest and the best agent, but I really think mm -hmm. it's if you have the support and the the right relationship with the agent that you have, that can really be the difference of you getting in the room and getting the job and all of those kinds of variables. Mm -hmm. So how did you, have you, so, so I guess maybe, have you been in casting rooms in all three places in both Australia, the States, and here, London? 
Or is it mainly so much? I'm kind of curious to know if there's a difference. Yeah. I haven't really been in any of the casting offices in America. Um, We used to have an audition class in uh, when I was studying in New York. And my, my teacher was, she would kind of run it as if you would go into a casting office. And the, the, it was just batshit crazy because it just felt so <laughs> foreign to like what I, I would feel. But like a lot, a lot of the time, like we'd be doing our monologue or our scene or our piece or whatever she had prescribed us. And uh, she'd be, you know, she'd be on the phone or she'd be like, you know, typing up emails or messaging and just not giving you the time of day. And I was like, <laughs> oh, I don't. Okay. I mean, like this is when I was completely new. I was like, yeah. wow, I, 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 casting here seems pretty brutal. <laughs> you know, and I was like, I think it was like a really heightened uh, kind of sensibility of what she thought the that mm. that casting there was like. I don't know. You can probably speak to that better. Is that quite accurate? Is that what you do? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I mean, I can't speak for the entire profession. I'm sure there are some people that are maybe a little disengaged, but I, like if I'm in the room, I'm in the room. Like I'm yeah. with you. I'm, I personally like to run camera in my office so that I can see the whole picture. And then I can, you know, I, I can make the adjustments that I need to in the moment, because if I'm, first of all, I'm not an actor. I've never, I've never trained to the level of, you know, of an actor to, to feel comfortable reading with somebody. So I would usually bring an actor in to read or if my associate was uh, more proficient than I am, I would have them. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, like if I'm in it, I'm in it. That's it. Yeah. That makes me sad that that's what they're training you for. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I think you know, like this was this was again. It was in 2009. I did this, so maybe that was the sensibility back then. But maybe. Yeah, I. I, I don't I, know. I, I think like in the states, they do like to over overly or make it quite harsh i think there is like an old school sense of like let's make this really difficult because that's that's our test to see if you can make it through type thing i think it's a bit of an old school mentality i don't think jess or i do this by any by any chance but it's like i do think i've seen it happen where people are a bit harsh i definitely yeah i think maybe it definitely seems that from the friends that i know that have gone out to you know maybe test for pilots or you know, I don't know if this happens so much when you're testing for pilots, but going onto a, a like into an auditorium with all your execs mm-hmm. and people like doing a sitcom uh, reading, but on a stage for like yeah. a whole sea of execs, it just seems so foreign to me for what the actual end product would be. How do you how do you expect to get the best out of your performer if you're putting them in this alien environment? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was always, I think, the most jarring experience part of the, of the casting process. Like, I was very lucky to come up in an office that was, you know, uh, sh- it was always make sure the actor feels safe to be able to do what they what they need to do and what, you know, what you need them to do. Um, but the testing process, which I feel like COVID killed a bit of that because um, everything is virtual. And if there are... I've seen now more uh, testing experiences are more like work sessions with the showrunner and the uh, executives that are um, the creative executives on the show. And then they send those tapes up to the the powers that be versus putting the actor through that turmoil. (laughs) I mean, that sounds really like useful as an actor. And I think if you come away from that as an actor, not having booked, booked the job, at least you feel like, you've worked something and you've learned, you've taken something from, from that session, or you've taken something from that experience where you're like, Oh, I, I didn't get the job. I got to work with, you know, JJ Abrams and he gave me these notes and I can, you know, for whatever reason I didn't get it, I can still say I've had that experience with that director or that casting director or that executive. Um, Mm -hmm. But I think in terms of like, I haven't been in any, rooms in Australia for so many years now and it, when I was going in the things there they were very very small kind of bit parts I don't think they had the scope for for me to kind of be reading for bigger leads at that that point in yeah. time I th- I feel like in the UK 
I because I, I started in musical theatre, and it's a very different playing field to to playing in screen. So it's uh, mm-hmm. I remember one of my first auditions in in the UK was for the revival of Miss Saigon, and I'm not a dancer, and I hate <laughs> dancing. And I will do anything that I possibly can to get out of a dance call for something. I can definitely move if you give me a rehearsal process, but I am not the kind of person that's going to be part of arraying around the room. And we went into this dance call and my friend said to me, it's like, it doesn't matter. Just wear the tightest clothes that you possibly can. And that's so you can just throw your body, throw your body and that's fine. You'll be fine. Cause I'm, you know, I go to the gym, I'm quite, you know fit and then they'll be like you'll be fine you'll be the pretty thing in the corner it's cool uh, <laughs> but, but, oh my God, what a like, friend what a friend what, what a friend right still didn't get the job but uh, <laughs> the, the kind of mentality of, of of everyone else being in the room and literally dancing circles around me because I couldn't pick up the mm-hmm. dance moves as some of these west end like you know such broadway boys could but putting their arms in front of your face and like you know really trying to show you what was like I'm not I understand this is a whole kind of competition thing but I I can't be be buying into that you know can I do some Meisner work please let's do some repetition yeah oh that's so what was the process like for slow horses then because was it, it did you get cast during COVID or no was it prior I did I did so so horses was actually um supposed to go just before the pandemic began um and I actually didn't have a whiff of it at that point in time but they shut down production um they were in prep and during kind of the prep time um over over the first lockdowns Nina was casting Nina Gold who cast me in so horses had been casting quite a few different projects um and she had had me I've read for her office for many years for in, you know, in different capacities um, or for different projects. And I'd never gotten to meet her, but that was like <laughs> an ambition. She is kind of elusive here. I've, I've come to realize. I just met her yeah. recently too. I have a funny story about it, but t- go on. <laughs> oh, I want to hear that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I put this tape out and I got a, an email back from my agent at the time saying that they want you to retape with notes and another scene. And I was like, oh, sick. Like, because when I read the script, it made so much sense to me because I knew Will, who's the head writer, I knew his work. So Mm -hmm. I had been, it, it just kind of like all the kind of comedy and stuff. I just, I just knew what was going on. Um, and yeah, they asked me to retape. I redid it with all the notes and I started obsessing about it, obsessing about it. And just as I was about to send it in, they called me to say they actually wanted to meet me in person. And it was the first in-person meeting since, you know, the lockdown. So for like six months. Mm. And as you can imagine, like I was incredibly anxious, like really just didn't know <laughs> to be around people anymore. Yeah, no, I mean, right. <laughs> I, I was caught I'm very close with my my sister and she I was talking to her about it the night before she's like you know what like you haven't got to do this for the past eight months and it's not about you liking them it's about uh, if them liking you it's about if you like them as well like it's mm-hmm. you're interviewing with them to see if you want to be part of their project so once you take the, the shift of power away in that dynamic which you're always kind of thinking is on the other side of the table when you come to it as equals, it's so much easier to do better work because you feel like it's a conversation and it's not like, please like me, please give me a yeah. <laughs> you know? Because it reads yeah. and it's, I'm sure that a lot of people came and still are coming out of the pandemic be like, I need to fucking work, I need a job, please give me a job. Whereas, you know, have switching that balance of being able to say like, this is what I have to offer, this is who I am and I would love for us to be able to work together to make something really great. That being the narrative is such a strong and powerful position to be in. And that's what I went in with. And it, I knew when I left that this was going to be the thing, like this was going to oh, be the thing amazing. that changed, wow. changed everything. So 
Yeah. That's incredible. Cool story. I love yeah. that. And I love that perspective that you had because I think actors do tend to put so much pressure on themselves, especially coming out of the pandemic of like, oh, I got to work. I got to do all this stuff. And it, it reads so much across the camera, you know, or even yeah. in, in person meetings. And I love yeah. that because why would you want to join a project that's like, you know, dealing with shit people or something? You know, you get yeah. to have a say in it too. Yeah. And I think yeah, like when you have the freedom to say, like, you know, have your ideas heard. It, it takes away all your inhibitions and it, it allows you to do your best work. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's such an interesting perspective to have because I, the idea of we, we tend, especially in this industry, we tend to freely give away our power. Yeah. Like it's a willingness that we all have in or because of it's like this desperation that's involved in it. But you know, we, we do, we have to have agency when we go into a room in order to show what we bring to the table. 100%. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Thank goodness for your sister. Yeah. <laughs> she talks a lot of sense. Yeah. Is she in the industry or no? She's, uh, she, she lives in Australia. She works uh, for the Department of Justice in Australia. So which is very oh, good at like nice. kind of human psychology. You know, she studied yeah. criminology, so she's she understands <laughs> how the mind works. Yeah, I love I having those outside is. influences, though. Like, because yeah. I feel like to have that like grounding force of like, we don't care about Hollywood. You know, <laughs> like you, you, I'll I'll come in and be the re voice of reason. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that's that's one of the things that's really great about you know having people that are outside of the industry always kind of. You know, I, I still work as a personal trainer in, in you know, the weeks that I have off from filming, um, not because I have to, but because I, I do love it. And I love being with mm -hmm. people from different walks of life. And mm -hmm. I feel like it gives me just as much uh, as I give them. Um, and it allows me to take myself out of the the industry and see, you know, things from a different lens and not be mm. start to become consumed by it because I only function when I have both worlds kind of going at the same time when I'm too heavily involved in my PT world it's like too much for me when I'm too heavily involved in the industry it's like it becomes you know <laughs> you know it's yeah. pretty crazy you know the highs and lows you can go mm -hmm. through but something that's kind of constant to keep you you know, on course the whole time and keep you balanced, I think is really healthy. So I always recommend to like friends like to try if they can while they're doing a theater job or even while they're filming to try and keep some some sense of normality in that because what we do is is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to piggyback on that, like the the idea of being immersed in the in the profession to a degree, you're married to an actor. So how does that work? <laughs> well, that's, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think about it. We actually had this conversation like last week because mm. we were, we were discussing like friends that have partners that are not part of the industry. And I definitely, it's, it's great because again, you have, if, if you have your partner that's not involved in, you know, kind of the, the acting side of things, then they, they can offer you like a real grounding, like my sister did for me kind of thing. Mm. But mm -hmm. I think so, like for me and for Frankie, when there are things that are going on within our industry, in, you know, in our world, uh, in our career world, having being able to have a dialogue where we completely and wholly understand one another is just something that I just can't imagine that I could live without in a partner anymore mm -hmm. you, you know she did you think you would get married to an actor absolutely not, absolutely <laughs> not. And to be honest like, I didn't I didn't think I would be acting for this for this long um mm. I when I moved over here and she always brings it up to me she I said I was giving myself five years to try and make something of myself here and then when I met her it was probably around 
the third year I was here or the second, third or third or second year I was here. And if it wasn't for her, I would have gone back to Australia a hundred percent. And I don't know what I would have done out there, but I definitely would have been trying my hand at something else because there've been years where it's been really lean, really Mm -hmm. lean in terms of, you know, not great auditions or the parts that I am auditioning for are very kind of like surface level um, where I don't feel like that's not the thing that's going to like push me forward as an artist. Like I've already done that in so- that, that part in some capacity. I think with my work, mm-hmm. when I kind of reflect back on it, I'm always trying to do something that steps it up a level each time if I can and not step laterally. Um, and if I look at my kind of CV, I feel like I've always done a job that's better and better and better. So hopefully that kind of continues. It's, but that's the hard thing. You have to always, if if that was my, that's my career plan, it means that I have to turn down a lot of stuff if I'm wanting to see myself in a certain way. So it means you're out of work for a of time. <laughs> that's a great, if that's a great message, be out of work, kids, it's great. <laughs> I think it's important, though, to like you have to whether you're an actor or or doing, you know, casting or whatever profession it is, you have to be really intentional with your work. And I think that speaks to it that you it's not just about taking the job. I mean, people that have to take the job have take the job. Right. Um, But at the same time, it's I think that that growth is so valuable to not only just in the kinds of roles that you get, but like where you are as a human. Yeah. I think as well, like it, I've been fortunate enough because of my, my side hustle that I've mm-hmm. never been beholden to having to take a job. So I have been able to be picky and choosy and being like, yeah, I'm not going to go on tour right now. I don't want to be away from Frankie in a job that's not going to, you know, either really launch me artistically or compensate me financially because I can sit in London and do what I'm doing as a personal trainer and wait for the better job to come along. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I had a lot of time to wait during the pandemic. (laughs) (laughs) So what's like the craziest job you've been offered that you're like, no, I'm not going to do that. I don't know if I've had crazy, crazy job offers, but I, I did a musical um, called Heather's. Um, based Mm -hmm. on the Dan Waters film. Uh, It was a cult classic. Um, And it was my first kind of really big foray into commercial musical theatre. And after I finished that, because it was such a huge success, I did have a lot of uh, regional theatres and, you know, theatres in London asking me to come in for, for different musicals. And I really knew that what I wanted to do was screen. And this is what you were saying, Jess, is that being intentional about your choices, I could have gone down that route very easily and had like a career doing that, you know, show to show to show. But Mm -hmm. I, I actively took myself out of that world, knowing that everyone in terms of casting in the UK for musical theatre has an idea of who I am. um, And then sat and waited for, you know, did my tapes with Nina for other projects until Slow Horses came around. And then that, that kind of, you know, that alchemy happened. Um, but I don't know if I've had any crazy days. <laughs> like know. Magic What's Mike hasn't co- been coming around being like, hey man, come join us. <laughs> <laughs> I had a, like, when I first started, uh, I'm going to tell you this story, but like when I first started auditioning for stuff, um, when I was, sorry, I'm having like trouble with my laptop. It's like trying to slide down. Okay. When I first started auditioning for, <laughs> bits and pieces in Australia I had a really like kind of kit child's agency I think it was and Mm -hmm. um they put me forward for a Japanese game show remake that they were making in Australia and it was called Hole in the Wall have you heard of Hole in the Wall no no right so basically it's like a big screen or a big kind of piece of foam that has a shape cut out of it and you have to make the shape to get through the hole in the wall otherwise the screen as it comes towards you will push you into a pool of like slime or water or whatever oh okay and you have to wear a lycra suit as well so that's fun (laughs) 
So for the audition, <laughs> I had to go to Channel 9 Studios and they put me in a bright yellow lycra suit and they were just yelling out things, shapes for me to make. So they wanted me to make myself into the the Sydney Harbour Bridge, which was one. What? So if I was to ask you, be the Sydney Harbour Bridge, Jen. Be the Sydney Harbour yeah, Bridge. Yeah, I'm mean, like, I don't know. <laughs> Pretty much what I did. All right, Jen. And then they want you to be a Big Mac. Please be a Big Mac for me in a shape. <laughs> I don't know. See, very much like the Sydney Harbour Bridge, that one. <laughs> what a weird request. That was probably the worst audition I've ever had because it just did like, this is not acting. This is like, you know, you know physical theatre maybe or, or something. <laughs> but, it, but this was in a studio full of executives on a proper sound stage as well. So I was like, this, it was like real money going on but it was quite possibly the lowest point of my acting career. So. <laughs> Good thing it was at the start. Yeah. I was going to say, at least it was at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, I think that was Oh, that's amazing. Then, yeah. Oh, that's funny. Sorry about that. <laughs> and hopefully you've never been asked to do that since. <laughs> do you know what I find? Have you, have, have you, either of you cast commercials before? A few of them I have, yeah. So talk to me about your process for casting commercial. Uh, this is what I'm interested in. I, well, because I have done so few of them, it's still very foreign to me. So I come from it from a theatrical perspective. So I don't do what the normal commercial casting directors do. Oh, I'd like to come in for one of your commercials then. Yeah. <laughs> I don't when know I've the heard about that, yeah. yeah, I've heard that they're just more of like cattle calls where you come in and it's like one person, it like a minute almost of like, you just come in, you do it, you leave. Like, it's just like this like roundabout or, type thing. Or multiple people at the same time in the same room. Like that was like oh, a really weird yeah. thing for me. <laughs> a lot. Yeah. I, I have been on so many commercial auditions and I've only ever booked one commercial. And it was probably, it was in the first few years, the first year that I was in the UK, I'd have never booked another one since. Um, <laughs> but there was a few different commercial auditions. One of them was for, I think, a car. We were in a car and so they brought us in in a group of four, me and like three Kid, not kids but like teenagers that were younger than me I'm like and I look quite young but I'm not um and they're like right so you're like on the holiday trip they give you these crazy scenarios and you just have to mm. act them out because there's no script because normally it's just montage right of whatever's going on in the in the commercial so you're in, you're all best friends and you're on this camping trip and you and you you two were in the front so I was in the front seat and the two of you behind are uh, just the passengers but you're going on this like awesome camping trip with your friends and like you're just having the best time and just like just be like buddy buddy it's gonna be great fun and like maybe you could all be singing a song and they were all like yeah yeah we'll sing this song i think it was um it was hotline bling by drake <laughs> of which again i had no concept of what drake was or who he was or what he was about and they're all like singing along like really like giving it some well and i'm like yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you, it was the most awkward thing and the casting director at the time was like if you could if you could really just sing a little bit more if you could like really like just enjoy and be more in voice with what you're singing like, i don't know this song these kids know this <laughs> song i can't be involved in this there's, there's very few times that i've almost walked out of a casting room and that was one of them so <laughs> Oh, man. that seems so awkward like to be like learn this song that you don't know and commit to it and, like... on the spot if you had told me before then like yeah i'm fine but i i'm okay yeah. at improving, but not a song that i don't know yeah <laughs> no oh that's amazing oh, um oh, jen I, I i i keep going back to your nina gold story i want to hear that. yeah i want to hear it yes too. okay so you know she's kind of like this like myth here like I feel like everyone like especially in the UK is like ooh Nina Gold like you know and <clears throat> I'm not like a person who really 
get starstruck by people. It takes a lot for me. And um, so a couple weeks ago was like the CSA RDOS Awards where they did like a very small thing in London compared to like the massive, you know, a, a celebration we, we have usually have in LA. And um, so I go and there's like five tables of people and Nina had been like nominated for something and won one. Um, and I happened to be sitting next to her associate. So um, she wins and she's like this tiny little thing. Um, and then at the end, I was standing there because United Agents was getting some award. It's like, thanks mm -hmm. for helping casting be so awesome, you know. And so I happened to be sitting at the United table and she came over to start talking to them. And again, I didn't really like I knew who she was just by like seeing her accept her award. But I also like in that moment wasn't like, oh, who are you? And I'm a very like affectionate person. Like I love to give hugs. I love to, you know, grab, you know, like grab your arm, like whatever. And so she's standing right next to me and she's talking like the head of United Agents, who is very nice. And I had just met with them a couple weeks ago. And she said, and I was like, oh my gosh, you're Nina Gold. And I go and I grab her arm just like, and I'm like, oh, it's so nice to meet you. <laughs> oh my God. I thought I like, sh like hit fire or something that the look she gave me was like, oh. <laughs> get your hand off me now. And she was like, I'm sorry, who are you? And I was like, oh, so sorry. <laughs> So like I introduced myself She's and I was like, like the American in the room. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I just I need to learn I I've been getting better with the Brit since being since moving over here cuz so I will say like the majority of people are very, you know, nice and like open and willing to give me a hug or whatever. Um but there are some times especially like if I go on generals with actors or something that I'm like, "Oh, here I'll give you a hug goodbye." And I one I think it's cuz I forget sometimes I'm a casting director in this situation. <laughs> that I'm just like, I've enjoyed the conversation that they're like, oh, yeah. oh you have to oh, give them okay. a job now, Jen. <laughs> you <laughs> hug them. You've basically given them the job. If I'm getting a casting director, I'm like calling my agent, and like, yeah, so we need to book out uh, these three months because I'm totally gone. <laughs> Either that or there's gonna be some like huge coalition of like UK actors who are like, she's, she's, sexually she's harassing me. everybody. <laughs> she's trying to hug us all. What is her problem? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so literally so i'm standing there next to nina I grab her arm realize instantaneously it was a mistake so i kind of like retract it really quickly and i just was like and i, I again i'm just like oh it's so nice to meet you because i just i come from a mentality of like i really want all casting directors to get along and support each other and i know that not all do um i think she might fall into that i don't and i don't even think that's that she cares if she supports them i just think she's too big to care um and so she just was like, I, she was getting ready to leave and she was still standing next to me. I could see that moment where she's like, please don't touch me again. <laughs> like, she was saying goodbye to the group. From a distance, bye, bye. Yeah, she was like, okay, so bye. And like, I like turned, turned her body away from mine. Like, it's like, don't worry, I'm not going to touch you again. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I learned my lesson. Yes. I haven't seen Nina since she cast me. Um, but she has cast me since in another project that, good, you know, which is great. Um, but I remember when I went into the, to the <laughs> meeting for Slow Horses because no one had had a had an in person meeting for months, and we mm -hmm. were talking a little bit about the pandemic. And this was, I think, maybe three months after the first lockdown. Um, so we were kind of coming out of second lockdown here in the UK. And said to me, it's like, how long do you think this is going to last for? I think maybe another six weeks. I was like, um, <laughs> I don't know about that. Maybe like, maybe a little bit longer. But she was very, oh, she was very nice. I think the thing that I really enjoyed when I went into that meeting, that that for, that meeting for Slow Horses, was that I made her laugh, like genuinely laugh, and I was like, oh, this is good. Oh. And I think that's when I knew. I was like, ah. Oh, this this is okay. Everyone is comfortable, and I think that's the thing, right? You must feel this as well when actors come into the room. And like you've made everyone super comfortable, and they just mm -hmm. like you, and yeah, that's that's really like half the battle, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would say like I. It's always fascinating to me because especially coming over here, I've done I've done so many actor generals trying to get to know everybody and whatnot, and it's been fascinating to see like the difference in. People are like, oh, you're so warm and easy to chat to and all this stuff. Because I 
I think sometimes we forget as casting people, since we don't work with them, you know, hand in hand anymore. It's like, there are some of those that are very scary to walk into <laughs> and they are like, I've heard the horror stories of, you know, people just sitting behind their desk and not even making contact or just saying go and then bye. Yeah. And you're like, no, no, like help in that respect. Cause I think, yeah. I don't understand that mentality of casting because it's like, what do you think the actor, I mean, I feel like being the actor there in already is enough pressure and it's like so stressful but to sit there then and be like rude about it, it's like, they're just going to feel more pressure. And you think they're going to give a good reading when they do that? And like, no, like they are probably going to be much more, you know, <clears throat> into the character if you actually feel comfortable in the room and around everybody else. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's always so jarring too, because you hear these stories from, from our friends who are actors and it's, it, cause it's, it feels foreign because I, I, I can speak for myself and like, m at least my generation of colleagues, we are so not this. <laughs> so it's, it's like such a weird thing to know that that exists out in the world. And obviously that, that sort of pop culture stereotype came from somewhere. Um, but I'm hoping that, uh, within, uh, you know, less years than more that we can change that dynamic, that it's, you know, that we're all working towards the same goal and then we're all trying, you're trying to be the answer to our, our problem. Yeah. I think like, I've not really walked into any casting room before and not felt like the, and I, I feel very lucky in this sense that not felt the casting director is kind of on side with me like actually trying mm -hmm. to give me give me what i need um you definitely f i feel like when i go in for musical theater i definitely feel like there's uh, there's always initially a bit of a distance and i you know mm -hmm. thankfully for me i've done you know those initial calls with all everyone so everyone here knows me but like initially when people are trying to get to know you they're like especially in musical theater it's like show me what you got what what can you do because mm -hmm. if not you there's someone outside that can do that and and that is the case yeah like musical theater is very cutthroat um but yeah i think in terms of acting like maybe sometimes in theater it can be a little bit more um maybe i don't want to say uppity but a little bit more kind of what am i trying to say do you know what i mean just like there, distant yeah like yeah. you know more of the gatekeeper mentality Mm -hmm. yeah it's a little bit more like oh well this is the highest form of art so you mm -hmm. must be like, amazing uh, but the funny thing is is the more that I work at the, a higher level which I'm very lucky to do the more you kind of realize that everybody is just making their best educated guess <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> everybody is making a good educated guess and to their tastes and to their likes and you know when you know that when you start to get to know your exec producers and on the show and which are which i've been lucky enough to do again on slow horses you know that it's taken eight or nine people to say yes to you along the process mm -hmm. you know and if one of them is like nah and you have to go back to yeah. the drawing board or if someone mm -hmm. doesn't fight for you you're like you could lose that job but if you if you're not in if you haven't worked in it you don't know that you just think ah sometimes as an actor you're like oh i just didn't I didn't do it. It's like no, eight mm. eight out of the nine people really wanted you for the part, and that ninth person was like, just not tall enough against that person. That you know that that girl that he's gonna play opposite. You know, yeah. just not. Yeah. Or their face is a bit funny. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> what or they that? look like an ex boyfriend or girlfriend. I've heard that one before. <laughs> <laughs> like. That, that's that that blows my mind yeah <laughs> what, what, what but that's the, the thing is yeah that like is that what's some of the things that like if you think that oh this actor's like down to the wire they almost got it and like one exec or one showrunner is like just not just not on board with it what's the kind of thing that loses it out for them it's never their ability as an actor really is it maybe no i th i mean i think I had an, an instance on a series that there was a young actress 
who had a great, uh, had great training and she showed that she was capable, but because she didn't have the experience, the executive of casting was trying to stand in the way and was not, was like suggesting an actor who was not tonally in line with what they were trying to do. Um, and so I found it really interesting. So we had to go back because everybody was super passionate about her on the creative team. And we had to go back and have the writers write additional material to to show sides of her as an actor that she could handle it, uh, 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 like elements of the character that you as an audience member would never even see. <laughs> Just to show that she was capable of handling it should it go somewhere else. And so I had to have her go into a, a casting office because she was in LA when she originally read and then... She went into a New York office. I arranged it with the Telsey's office to make sure she had a casting director with her to get her through that material. And then that was the stuff that we showed to the, the studio and the network to be like, look, everybody wants her. Everybody's fighting for her. She can do it. Now hire her. And yeah. it worked. Wow. She got the role. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I will say, you know, it's fascinating because, like, I think the most, and I think coming out of COVID especially, I feel like I've seen a lot of times where um, a lot of it's ego. Like, sometimes they just want to be the one person to say no. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they realize there's a person on the other side of that. Because I same kind of thing. Like, I've had to fight, like, tooth and nail for actors and prove all these things that we never used to have to do just to be like, but they're real. Like, you know, <laughs> they're really good for this. Like, this is, this is what's supposed to be. And I think sometimes that gets overlooked a little bit because it, it, you know, again, everybody only sees the end product. And of course at like some red carpet event and they're like asking the director or producer, like, how did you know you wanted this person? They're always going to be like, I knew from the moment I saw him that I wanted him. Oh yeah. And I always sit there and I'm like rolling my eyes. I'm like, all the times I had to like show you this material. Like I went, there was a girl, well, I won't name her, but there was a girl that I wanted for my lead who was a pretty well-known actress. And this one producer, and it was all ego-based. I think it's because it wasn't his idea. Mm. And like, he's like, I don't see it. I don't see it. And I went back to like her Instagram and like was scrolling back through the years. And I'm like, I mean, Instagram's become a super tool for me in trying to like, yeah. prove other sides of actors. Um, because we only get the reel and then the, the tape. Um, and even if like, I know them and I can be like, I can vouch for this person. I've seen them do X, Y, Z or whatever. Mm -hmm. I'll go into like Instagram and I'll go way back into the troves and I'll be like, look, you know, look how edgy she is here. <laughs> like, she yeah. isn't just like, you know, Miss America. And, um, that's been really fascinating to me to kind of see, like, I think it's like you, you almost have to convince them it was their idea all along. Um, you think, which then you sucks think... for us because then we lose all the credit sometimes that on the exec level or and above that unless they're shown it in a very visual form they don't have the imagination to be able to see it sometimes, sometimes. i think that's also we've had i had a i worked on a pilot that um this is now years ago um it's the imagination and also like being aware of the other mediums. And I'm hoping that this has gotten better, but it was for a pilot that I was working on as an associate. 